My name is Jack Ely, and today I'm with our Head of Business Development and Head of Partnerships, Karis. Now, we've not really spoke much about our business model. Uh, however, today we are going to go over what we do and pretty much what we're building at the moment. So I'm going to actually let Karis kick things off. So Karis, what is it you do in the business? So I feel like my role has changed a lot, hasn't it, in the last yeah. like, year since I've been with the company. But predominantly at the minute, what I do is I project manage to an extent I'd say like the different projects we've got going on we've got about probably about four or five different big projects going on at the minute so it's sort of trying to oversee those and ma like helping to map out what our scope's going to be and like the different briefs and yeah. you're basically a jack of all trades like that'd be the best way of explaining what your role is bit. because you adapt between all of the different models that we run yeah but our background is actually distributing luxury designer brands so from maybe 16 17 years old my story was going to outlet stores buying faulty products with let's say broken zips i've said this on podcasts before repairing these products and then reselling them for a profit on platforms like depop and ebay and back when i was 16 17 years old there was an outlet store that used to take all of the returned goods from an authorized retail store and they used to sell these items at you know 90 to 95 percent off of the retail price so that is how i pretty much got into reselling and then over the past two years we've pretty much transitioned the business model now we was very heavy on buying stock before wasn't we yeah and we started to see you know like a lot of issues with cash flow because we'd be dumping a lot of capital into deals and then we wasn't able to turn over the stock fast enough in order for us to you know, like maintain our contracts with the retailers that we was working with in order to get allocation for more products. And this mm -hmm. is where Karis's role initially started. We realized that we needed somebody to go into commercial planning um, and somebody to oversee the different partners that we work with and come up with a strategy in, in order for us to become more effective with managing and leveraging our liquidity. Um, so Karis, do you wanna go into a bit of like a background brief about yourself in what roles you've been in the past yeah. and also like sort of what we're working on at the moment in regards to our software that we're building? Ooh, I don't know how much I can give away, but yeah. Um, so I started with, at university, I studied fashion management. So basically everything that goes on behind the scenes of a retail company, like you're buying and merchandising, your marketing, like everything, just like an overall summary of it all. Um, and then went into like more of a specialism for my masters for marketing. And then after that, I went into a graduate role at Fraser's Group. So I worked as a trainee commercial manager for them. So that's like buying merchandising combined in one. So they don't have two separate teams. They've got just one role. It's very much 360. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so I learned a lot in that, which was great. And then was just on LinkedIn one day and saw this job come up and I was like, Morley Group, who's this? <laughs> <laughs> and so for those that don't know as well, Morley Group yeah. was pre our previous brand. Uh, so we've now rebranded to Resellers Room. Sorry to interrupt you. Oh, no, that's fine. Um, but yeah, and then obviously I found this job, um, which the role originally was advertised as junior buyer because like you mentioned, we were previously buying a lot of stock but then obviously the way the business models worked it's shifted now um so as part of that just like a few of the projects we're working on at the minute so the main one is a new software that we're going to be launching we are working on developing an all-in-one platform for our resellers so where they can buy and sell their goods in the same place and just have everything easily accessible so lots of different features that Currently, they're a bit scattered all over the market and we're going to be centralizing that into just our one core platform. So that's the key thing that we're working on at the minute. The main amount of our time is going into that. Um, and then we've got a few other bits going on behind the scenes as well. But I'd say that's the main one currently that we're yeah. pushing. Yeah, so it's one of them things where as a business, we realized that when we look at how much time we put into Morley Trends, which is another one of our businesses, like the amount of investment time return that business requires on unnecessary ad hoc tasks, we realized that we needed to systemize and reverse engineer our backend in order for us to scale past seven figures. Because last year, you know, we was able to churn stock out really fast. We enrolled a lot of members into our platform. However, we were still spending so much human labor on some of the things that we didn't necessarily need to do. And our business model 
relies heavily on trade groups. Now, in reselling and personal shopping, and you can agree with me on this, Karis, if you look to buy a pair of Louis Vuitton trainers in a UK7 and your client needs a brand new pair, how you actually broadcast and find that specific pair of shoes is by you going into a WhatsApp <laughs> chat and you saying, want to buy UK7 and these LV trainers. And then other resellers in the marketplace, let's say there's 10,000 of them across 100 group chats, they would then pick up these inquiries, come back to you as a reseller and say, look, I've got these in a size seven, and it wouldn't usually even be the specification of the actual shoe you're looking for. And in our business model at the moment, we studied Farfetch for about a year. So do you wanna speak about what the competitor analysis and the SWOT chart that you built was on Farfetch yeah. and some of the biggest opportunities that they presented in their model as to what we've taken into ours? So with Farfetch, we did a lot of research. I think the main thing that stood out to us was even though they're this like massive like luxury company, everyone knows them for like the luxury clothing they offer, they had a real focus on actually improving their back end and the technology side of things, which is something before we hadn't really considered. Like we were just going to our suppliers, we were buying the stock, we were uploading it onto the WhatsApp, uploading it onto the website. Like we didn't really have a streamlined technology process. Whereas when we were looking into them and how they run their systems, first of all, we noticed they had multiple different systems running in the back end, which we don't really have. And also they've just got a really clear process with how they operate. So I feel like they they were like a main inspiration point for us to wanna, like you were saying before, re-engineer the back end and figure out the, the back end first and get that up to standard. And then the front end will follow suit after that. Now, I think it's great as well that we are so entrepreneurial driven. And I think from a young age, especially for myself, I've always wanted to pursue a career in building companies. And, you know, Morley Trends is our bread and butter. That's our B2C platform. So if you just want to buy, you know, a luxury handbag, you'd go to Morley Trends. We've got a team of sales who are managing them inquiries and working with the supply chain in order to source that desired product for you as a client. And the great thing about the business model for us as well, outside of us buying deals, um, a lot of the time we'll take the payments up from, from the clients and leverage their capital to buy that desired product. So the best way I like to explain our business model to other fellow entrepreneurs, we're almost the insurance broker mm. for, for designer I products, so. very similar to Uber. And the reason Uber is such a great, unique platform is because all they're doing is they're the middle ground between drivers and customers and they're taking that affiliate commission in between. That's essentially what we are. That's essentially what Farfetch do. Farfetch take a 25 to 30% affiliate commission every single time they sell a product on behalf of their vendor, AKA partner. And again, I think as you start to build one company, it will t teach you so much about not only building infrastructures and building systems, also teams, that then allows you to plug and play these resources into many other companies. So for now, we're just an incubator. We've got the resource for what we need. We're obviously looking to expand as quickly as we can with the right people in place. But whenever it comes to us launching a new brand now, let's say, for example, Morley Sports, that's a recent active wear company we just launched for B2C. Say you want to buy a Nike Milliset or, you know, like an Under Armour tracksuit, you would go to Morley Sports. And we have now got a team built around that company specifically for that niche. Same again with Resellers Room, that's our educational platform. That is what is gonna help us accommodate and achieve economies of scale. And in any business, in order for you to buy buying power with a retailer to acquire a commercial contract, a lot of the time with these retailers, of course, it's important to approach them corporately. It's great to maybe include a deck in that proposal and clarify exactly what your mission statement is as a company and your goals. But at the same time, when it comes down to it, it's all about how much money you're gonna spend with the business. At the end of the day, any business is run to earn money. So if I own a brand and I have a reseller approaching me, I'm gonna to wanna to know how much you prepared to spend on this order. I don't really give a shit about your mission statement. I just wanna know how much you're gonna spend. And that's what it comes it down true. to. And when you look at these authorized retailers, such as Louise of Iroma, um, you know, like Selfridges, Harvey Nichols, Mr. Porter, Netta Porter, Matches Fashion, the list goes on. When you look at the average ratio between B2B distribution and B2C distribution, it's 60-40, 60, 60 being B2B. And once we did that market research and conducted competitor analysis, that made us realize that we need to significantly double down on our B2B infrastructure, which is why we've built our own marketplace, which is why now we're trying to establish more of a solid ecosystem. Um, but I think 
less on the business side, I think the core purpose as to why me and Karis got together, got together today was to speak more about personal audits, psychology, and understanding us as people. Because you see a lot of gurus online now and a lot of people who just do the motivational talk, the self-discipline, and all of these great things that give you instant gratification and short-term dopamine. However, what you don't get is, you know, like, just understanding authenticity. I think for us, we just want to let you guys get to know us as people. And that's why we're going to go into a few questions now, just about life. Nothing too intense. Just exclusive just inside. Exclusive behind insights the behind the scenes <laughs> as to who the resellers room, Morley Trends, Morley Sports team are, and just getting to know us as people. So we're going to kick things off with some questions. I'm going to let okay. you start, Karis. Okay, so I'm going to kick things off with something a bit more psychology based. And that is, how do you think having an understanding of neuroscience affects your growth and your success as an entrepreneur and as someone who's CEO of multiple different businesses? Neuroscience is so important. And the reason for that is because there's an area in the brain called the anterior middle singular cortex. And what this is responsible for is when you don't want to do a certain task or you don't want to do something intense, it actually grows when you are in uncomfortable positions. So if you look at obese people, when they start to diet, this area of the brain grows. And I think as an entrepreneur, even though neuroscience is important from a psychological perspective, and me knowing that mm. gives me the conscious mind of thinking, you know what, if I don't get up today or yeah. I don't go and have a cold shower, for instance, yeah. I'm not going to be able to grow that area of the brain. So mm. I think, you know, like, you look at a lot of this junk information online and mm. there's probably a lot out there that states you have to have this certain morning routine. I just think usually you will grow the fastest when you feel the most uncomfortable. Yeah. And that's right. my analogy on business. Yeah. Uh, I guess as a CEO in relation to neuroscience. And the great thing about this area in the brain is that we can actually build on it. Mm. And if we don't invest the time into growing it, it will always retain in the same size within the brain. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important that everybody always looks to become uncomfortable with being comfortable. Definitely. What are the core characteristics that you would like to see in your future husband? Oh, that's a good one. I would say definitely the biggest one, I feel like probably an obvious one for most people, but is loyalty. Like I feel someone, not even just like loyalty in terms of like doesn't cheat on you, but as in someone who's like loyal to you and like what you want to pursue, like they don't, I don't know, they just stick by you throughout like thick and thin. Like I think that's something that's really important. Someone who's very driven as well and has their own goals that they want to actually work towards, but then will also help you work towards your goals. I think that's massively important. And then another point as well, something that I'd look for in someone is someone who actually like cares about their own health and like their fitness. Like I feel like it, that might be something that's like quite often overlooked and it's not like the main selling point like be all and end all but I feel like it's definitely something that I'd look for someone who wants to put good things into their body someone who I can like go on a hike with go to the gym with like someone who wants to better themselves physically as well as mentally like I feel like that's a massive thing and yeah I feel like then as well just all like the usual characteristics like someone who's actually like caring and like kind like, I feel like they're massive things as well but definitely like the loyalty and drivenness are like two of the main things for me I'd say. It's important to have a healthy mind. Yeah. Healthy mind, healthy, healthy mind, body. Healthy body, yeah. And do you know what? I actually feel like I've neglected my fitness as well, you know. Like, you've been getting onto me for getting onto the gym, like, actually doing things that are going to mm. activate my If you're in a bad mood, realm. I always say to you, just go to the gym. I know. And, like, do you know just what? go as do sport. Do you know it when really you, helps. Do you know when you've trained as well, the mental clarity that you get after you've trained is mm. like no other. Oh, 100%. Like, it's... It, I just can't even explain it. Like there's been times before. And, and you know what it is? There was a study actually on high performers. It was mm -hmm. um, a sample size of only maybe a hundred people. And it was employees in Amazon, I believe. And what they looked into was those who were on in like, what roles were they in now? Those who were in senior roles, high performers wise, mm -hmm. they, they had 50 people on one side of the study, 50 people in the other. And those who were in the 50 exercised five times per week. And when it came to doing like a personal quarterly audit on mm -hmm. themselves and their own well-being and this, you know, like work and satisfaction, 
they rated like a 25% increase wow. in satisfaction, even within work, just because they were exercising more. Yeah. Can't remember what the stats were. That doesn't even surprise like me though, because if like, if I've ever had a bad day or I can't think clearly, even just going for a walk down the street for like five, 10 minutes, mm. really that like, sorts you out, just getting your body moving a bit. Mm. But yeah, I completely agree. My next question for you is, what do you think is the biggest obstacle to people succeeding and actually getting what they want in life as someone who is like a CEO of multiple businesses? Like what for you were the biggest obstacles and how would you advise people to tackle them? Laziness. Yeah, and, I agree with that. And having discipline mm. because you can only go so far with motivation. Yeah, definitely. But on the days where you actually don't feel like doing anything, still performing and going to do the thing that you need to do Definitely. is the most important thing. Like, 100%. yo, I was working. I remember when I was in my day job, I was on an apprenticeship at Morrison's for three years. You know about the story. Yeah, yeah. Like, I used to go to work, go and stack fresh food on shelves in Barnsley, I'd travel for 45 minutes. I'd get up at mm. 4 a.m., leave it till the last minute to get out of bed, get there for five after traveling for 45 minutes, go and stack the food on the shelves. I'd work until 2 p.m. in the afternoon, maybe three, not get home till four, shattered. I'd have a power nap for 20 minutes. And whilst I was at work, I'd be managing my inquiries and my customer service whilst in work. And I'd be wow. running away like from the managers. I must've had about five disciplinaries. Dean, if you're watching this, he'll back <laughs> it up, I promise. But the thing is, is that I never gave up in the evening because I knew that if I continued to visionize exactly where I wanted the mm -hmm. company to be, I knew by making that short-term sacrifice, I was able to get the freedom that I now desire as an entrepreneur. And I think that it's really hard starting out a company. And a lot of the time, especially in this info space product now, it, um, in this info space now, um, business models are changing so fast. And in my opinion, right now, it's, it's, the, it's the gold rush. Definitely. Anybody who wants to start earning money online, just build one high valuable skill. Mm. One, in my opinion, that anybody can look into at the moment is understanding go high level. So software mm -hmm. and a lot of businesses at the moment aren't managing customer data correctly. So in regards to email automations, building pipelines for sales teams, copywriting and building email flows. All of these components are such high value skills that any small brand won't have at the moment. So I think if anybody wants to start a company right now, go onto YouTube and start watching as many YouTube videos on go high level as possible. Uh, I've got a friend called, you know, Charlie McCormack. Yeah, you met Charlie. I yeah. uh, had this conversation with him literally six months ago. Do you know what he made this month? 9,000 pounds. Wow. Just from building automations for businesses and wow. building email flows and almost going into the role as a consultant within yeah. the digital space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because what that allows you to do is work remotely mm -hmm. and also build a great network online. For me personally, when I first started out reselling, I could only build a network of consumers who were buying the products from me. Mm -hmm. They would be to see clients. The great position at the moment, especially with inf the info space, is the fact that all of the clients you are working with and networking with, even if it's just a called outbound DM um, or ringing a business on the phone, old school, um, you are actually building a network of entrepreneurs. You're not building an, a network of end consumers, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. And you can exchange so much value and learn so much information about that specific business and plug and play them resources and characteristics into other companies. And the great thing about going into a consultancy role with high level as an agent, I guess, is the fact that once you've built one set of pipelines for one business and one email flow, let's say, you can then spot another company in the same industry as what you built that for and that's with that with that company and just literally duplicate the flows and plug yeah. it into another business so everything's evergreen yeah and it's plug and play so yeah i think discipline and understanding info space right mm -hmm. now education yeah. online education i don't know if anybody saw uh, what alex hormozzi said as, as well about universities now losing 50 million dollars in the us every single year wow and there's an uplift of 100 million now in just online courses and education mm. so them stats show statistically that we are in the right space and i think 100%. that if people can adapt high value skills around this have the discipline to go and learn mm. understand that not every business is fun either i get up on certain days and think to myself you know what as a ceo I really can't be bothered today like mm -hmm. and you'll have them stages where you do feel like giving up no matter what the size of the company is mm -hmm. like there's always going to be elements where you are you are you are thinking about you know like not pursuing it yeah completely you just got to show up 
And also, one other key bit of advice um, with what are the traits, work for free. Yeah. Go and work with somebody who owns a business completely for free. Mm -hmm. And if you turn around and say, yo, I can't find a business to go and work with, it's, like, it's just bullshit. Like the amount of companies that are online now, the amount of DMs we get from people who are just keen to come and work with us for the day. We've bought people in before just to come and spend a bit of time with us. Like so many people are so eager and to go out of the way to, to just learn and be a sponge. Yeah. And that's the best analogy uh, I can give. Just work, yeah. with, work with other entrepreneurs. I think willingness to learn is a massive thing for but being an entrepreneur, like I think you have to be willing to set aside time to like learn and better yourself and better your skills, um, for sure, like like you were saying. I think as well, something you were saying um, about having that vision when you're at Morrison's, like you, you just knew that like it was gonna pay off. Like mm. you have to back yourself and know that it's gonna pay off and like see the vision of where you're gonna be. That I think in itself helps your discipline. Self-fulfilling prophecy is the theory I like to stand on personally because in school, especially during the early years of primary school, a lot of the time with young children, they won't get fat down to genetics. It will play a crucial role, but usually how they get fat is from negative reinforcement from classical conditioning. And mm -hmm. a lot of the time with self-fulfilling prophecy, these children, when they're getting called fat, will attach that label negatively mm -hmm. and continuously keep reinforcing that. And that mm -hmm. will then become a prophecy for how they then turn fat. Mm -hmm. So I think what you feed your mind and self-talk and how you speak to yourself and affirmations and also what you decide to listen to. That's a big yeah, thing. You can, be a lot, you can be around a lot of different peers and people who will try and put things in your head, but you have to go with what your gut tells you and what you think is not only morally right, but what you think is going to be the best for you. Definitely. At the end of the day, there's two things that's, that's guaranteed in life. You are born on your own and you die on your own. Yeah, so you don't true. always feel like you have it's to agree true. with what everyone says. You can challenge people on things. God likes people who challenge things as well. And mm -hmm. it's not always about, um, yeah, listening to every Barry, Joe and Tom. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's the best way of me explaining it. As a female, would you be satisfied with an entrepreneur who you guarantee would know provide for you? However, he can only allocate maybe three to four hours a week for you as your downtime. Or... Would you prefer to be with someone who's working class, earns a decent bit of money, but he can give you all the time in the world in the evenings because he doesn't have any extra workload? What sacrifice as a female would you prefer to have within a man? That's very hard because I feel like, like we've had this conversation before where like, I need my own space in the day. Like I'd very much suit someone who will give me in the day and then like I'll see him in the evening and... I, I can't deal with someone who's going to be there 24 seven, which is probably a harsh thing to say, but, but then equally, I don't know. I feel like I'd want a midpoint, which I know I'm just, I'm just escaping the question, but and oh, I actually a, don't know. As a female, it's, how would you almost liaise with your partner? If you are with an entrepreneur for the mm. female audience that are going to be watching this, how do you think you could have that conversation with an entrepreneur where you want to find the equilibrium between you not, almost getting in the way of his goals but at mm. the same time ensuring that you are prioritized in the relationship definitely i How? think that's a massive thing as well like what you were saying like you have to respect the fact that if someone's an entrepreneur they've got their own businesses they're gonna have to set aside a lot of time to work on that and it's like it, nine to five but times like 100 like <laughs> it's like 24 7 it's a job that like you could be rang in the middle of the night about something so you have to like respect that and respect their goals if you want the relationship to work um but I think the best way to go about it would be just like have an honest conversation with them and communicate it. Like, I feel like that's the main reason, like nowadays, especially a lot of relationships break down is because people don't communicate. If, you, if, you've, got, if you've got a problem, people will just push it to the side and think, oh no, it's fine. And then it will always bubble up to the surface again in the future. Like, I think, yeah, just communicating, saying like, look, can we set aside, like even if it's like one night a week where you sign it to like a date night or for like half a day on a Saturday, that's like designated as your time with that person where like the phone is off, the that's you, out of office is on. Like, yeah, just definitely having like honest communication about it, scheduling some set time to see that person that works around their schedule, but then equally say like an important meeting comes up in that time, have the flexibility where you can say, okay, well, then we have to do it like this time instead. Like, yeah, I think honesty, communication, the two big things for sure.
So who do you think have been the three most influential people in your life to get you to the point where you are today? My mum, number one. Yeah. Uh, reason for that is because she's highly driven. She's always provided for me and my family, uh, not to neglect my dad as well, but she was probably my first role model in regards to why I actually started entrepreneurship. And she always helped me and, and motivated me to do it. I'd say the next person was my old business partner, Zach. Uh, back when me and Zach was in school, Zach was pushing business ideas and concepts and almost in a way persuaded me to explore that path. Even though he wasn't fully in it himself yet, he was still conceptualizing, which I think it's really important to have someone as a right hand man especially when you are growing to bounce ideas off one another. Mm -hmm. And I'd say thirdly, um, and there's one more person I'd like to add after this, um, a woman called Holly. She was the previous, mar one of the previous marketing directors at Facebook. She mentored me massively during my entrepreneurial journey and spotted the things proactively that I knew what I didn't know about them would be the mm. biggest challenges that we'd face as a business. That when we look it back at it now, we now sit together and laugh about things that we were reactive about and we laugh at the fact that I didn't listen to her. So I think that if there's someone in, uh, you know, a very high level, high corporate job role who can sit down with you and identify op opportunities within your business alongside things that could potentially pop up in a year, two, three, four, five years from now, you can't always see business on a short term scale. It's important to view things holistically over longevity. And mm -hmm. that's what she was always managing to do. Um, and then the final person, my new angel investor, George, who's taught me loads of diff different things about managing teams and building a true culture within a business. I think like we scaled massively over the past two, three years. We did over three million in revenue and we needed to build teams out fast. But one thing we didn't have in the older teams that we started to build was any form of democracy as a culture. Mm -hmm. And I think that one thing I learned from George is truly how, how to build a... Uh, a tall hierarchy in a business with a democratic approach rather than it being autocratic, which I think mm -hmm. is very important when you're Definitely. building any business because how autocrats perform is it's very much me. I make the decision. Um, and there's also a very tall hierarchy with how responsibilities need to be passed through multiple, you know, like levels of departments until it finally reaches the bottom of the structure. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that at the end of the day, your employees and the teams that you build in any company, they're the people who listen to your customers the most and get the most qualitative and quantitative data from them. So if they are speaking to the customers the most, then how can you argue against what a suggestion might look like? And I heard Grant Cardone speak about once how every decision he makes in his business as an autocrat, he sticks to it regardless of what the output is. Even if it does fail, so what? I'm responsible. I made that decision. And I think there's a fine line between listening to feedback from the teams that you have and making a decision as a CEO of a business that will bring the best results regardless of either side. I think they're equally important and I think it's quite selfish to have that mindset, to be honest. Definitely. And I think one thing you mentioned there as well, like having that mentorship throughout like your journey, I think that's a massive thing. Like If you can find someone who can give you that mentorship that advice that support who's done it before almost mm. like, i think that's really important do you know what's so funny people think you have to pay for mentorship really you don't have to pay for mentorship do yeah, you know what it is with entrepreneurs what you'll find with most entrepreneurs all of them share one common trait mm. and that is they are givers as people mm -hmm. and i think that when you spot somebody who wants to really try and pursue something and achieve a dream or a goal as an entrepreneur, you believe in that person to think, you know yeah. what, well, I was once that person and I also once had support from you. And the best way of me explaining it, it's almost like an evolution mm, because definitely. you've got to think the next generation of children who are 12, 13, 14, 15 now, they are going to be the next breed of entrepreneurs within yeah. the e-commerce space. And they're going to have to build the companies in order for us to maintain a strong economy. Mm -hmm. And I think that you can't neglect that we've all been in the position where we've needed help and support in the past and it's free to give value. There's nothing wrong with telling someone how to do something and giving them that advice. Like, What are you losing from that? And in my opinion, every single time you help someone in need, regardless if it's from a mentorship perspective, even if you donate something to a homeless person or give some money to a charity, you will always fivefold that in small wins. Good karma. Afterwards. You'll good always karma. get good karma. 100%. Um, 
And for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. It's Newton's 100%. law, the third law. So 100%. you can't argue against the 100%. science. Completely agree. <laughs> Completely agree. When you was 12 years old, what did you want to do with your career and why? So when I was 12, I actually wanted to go into interior design originally. I don't know why. I think because like, as a kid, you know, I don't know if this is so much a boy thing, but definitely for girls, like girls will relate to this. Like every week you'd want to rechange your room around. Like I'd be in the middle of the night, it'd be like 1am and I'd be moving my bed around, moving my desk around, like just wanted to redesign how it looked. And then from that, I just thought actually this would be a pretty cool job if I could design people's rooms and their homes for them. And then my uncle's wife, she actually said to me, she was in interior design at the time and she was like, avoid it like it's really difficult to get into you don't get paid very well which I don't actually know if that's the case anymore I feel like it can be quite well paid but it is difficult to get to that position so she said to me like she just sort of was trying to nicely say to me like why don't you try like a different avenue that's like similar so then I was just sat googling one night like okay what other sort of design like arty things could I do and then I came across fashion design and I was looking into that. And originally that's the path I wanted to go down was being like a fashion designer. Um, but then I realized I'm not actually that great at designing off the top of my head. So then that's when I went into more like the back end side of it. But yeah, interior design, that's what I thought I was going to go into when I was 12. Or, and then probably before that I was teaching. I feel like every, every kid, again, might be different for boys, but I feel like definitely a lot of girls I know wanted to be teachers when they were younger. But yeah, at that age, interior design, I'd say. How important do you think paralinguistics are in business? Right, so I'm going to give you all a little clue now as to what paralinguistics are, right? I don't know if you've guessed yet, but basically <laughs> it's hand movement and how you articulate yourself through body features. Mm -hmm. And I think that when whenever you meet entrepreneurs, a lot of the time you'll notice that they give a lot of da 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 da, -da. Mm -hmm. I know you've probably seen in a lot of my videos in the past yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll use a lot of hand movement. And I think the reason for that is because it gives you a sense of confidence and I think it also builds trust with the person that you're speaking to. And I don't know if it's maybe a bit of ADHD as well, to be honest. I don't know what it could be. Maybe I've just like moved around a lot. I've had a lot of people say that in a lot of videos <laughs> that I move too much. But um, I think, yeah, it can just become, you know, you give off more positive energy, I guess. Yeah. I, I think it makes you more confident as well. Like you just seem like you've got better presence. And yeah. It makes people pay attention to you and actually listen to you as well, I think. Yeah. And I think as well, one other thing, right? You've got to think now, because of social media, the attention span of yeah. people now is Awful. unbelievably bad. And I think that in person, because you're used to having instant dopamine hits from social media and using TikTok, the reason you scroll on TikTok is because it's like the casino, you're gambling. It's like a slot machine, tick, mm -hmm. tick, tick. And I think that in person, you have to focus on retaining a check retain an attention span in order for people to listen to you. And I feel like the hand movement and paralinguistics often retains them in the conversation. 100%. So that's, that's the reason I think it's important. Do you believe as a leader, you can be good at both systemizing and like the mathematical side of things as well as the creativity side? Or do you think it's always one or the other? I'm gonna be completely honest. I think that you need to find talent and recruit the best possible people who are better than you at their division than you are. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is, am I a specialist in paid media buying with PPC and Facebook ads? Absolutely not. I'll have an understanding of the strategy mm -hmm. and I'll know how, and I'll understand the vision as to what I need to, to execute with a goal within that department. However, I'm not the one who's gonna be building the ad sets mm. and building the UTMs and the attribution to understand what the results are gonna look like. So in regards to the question, can you be a systemizer and mathematical and be a creative leader? I think that you are one or the other. Um, I've met very few people who, who can do both. I'm not really that data driven personally. However, what we do have is a great finance department who understand you know, data sets a lot better than I do. I'm definitely more creative and I think that everybody should double down on the strengths. You can't always yeah, be a jack of all trades. If you're trying to manage multiple components all at once, you're just going to pour the water against too many different glasses. And every single time you use your energy and you think of a glass of water and you're pouring it against nine glasses all the time, how much water are you going to have le left in each glass? It's going to be a tiny bit in each one. Mm. Double down on two things that you're very, very good at or just one thing and keep your glass full in that one one thing and leave the the other people who are the best at to to do the other things 
Like I'm not a good planner, I'll be honest. Karis, you do a lot of my planning for me. Like with what my day yeah. looks like and one of the things we implemented yesterday is look, we're gonna write down the tasks that we need to achieve for the week and we're now gonna block out time in to order for us to them execute done. them tasks from a business development standpoint. And you're a great organizer, I'm not a great organizer. So openly admitting right now, I'm gonna <laughs> delegate that to you <laughs> to help me plan it because you're the best at it. Same again with all of behind the camera now. I'm not a production guy. I know how to use my iPhone and create good clips and I can have a creative spin on it. But again, Oliver is the videographer. Oliver's head of production. Mm. He can lead that. That's, yeah. that's, the, that's the whole reason you're here, brother. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think to the attempted Donald Trump assassination recently? Right, I'm going to be completely honest, yeah. And I've spoke about this to a few of my other friends. <laughs> uh, I do think he was like purposely like set up mm. by specific organizations to be assassinated. Mm. Because how are you telling me right now that a man within a hundred yards managed to climb on top of a warehouse with a rifle mm. with the soon to be next president at a rally only a hundred meters away from, from the president? Like, how are you telling me they can even get a shot? No. Like, and do you know what's crazy as well? Firstly, they missed, and then there mm. were six more shots after that, and Donald Trump as well still stood there at the front, even after the first shot. It was maybe after the fourth shot that he actually went down, like, and actually started protecting himself. Wow. And as well, there was multiple people with their cameras out recording. There was a woman behind Donald Trump who, like, did a nod with her glasses on, and she was recording through a phone. We'll have to load up the clip whilst I'm speaking about it now. But I just think that how can you, like, if I've got a rifle, I remember, yeah, I used to go airsoft as a kid with a rifle. If I'm trying to shoot a target and it's a circle target, I am not missing the piece of paper. Mm -hmm. Like, whoever's, got, whoever's a kid and he knows how to construct and carry a rifle, he knows how to shoot. And do you know what's mad as well? He moved his head at the perfect time. Mm. Like, the perfect time. I just think, personally, it's coincidental. Not to sound sick, and I'm glad, you know, like, nothing did happen to him. Um, I think, personally, if I was going to be the next president and I needed more votes, <laughs> I'd probably finesse that as well. <laughs> like, truthfully. Do yeah, no, I, mean? I agree. Like, obviously, I agree. the great PR tactic. he's got from that. Like, again, maybe it is just I'm just being a conspiracy theorist. Maybe I'm, I am just doing no, that. No, I but do agree. I think personally, it was organized perfectly. He didn't mind taking the shots of the year. And it's as simple as that. He, I, needed, yeah. he needed the extra leads to come through the door into the CRM. <laughs> needed to retarget his audience one more time just to get them extra votes. Accomplished and executed the goal. And now he's going to be elected. And it's as simple as that. Do you believe in second chances? It depends how bad the fuck up was the first time around. And mm. it depends on the circumstance. So I think within a relationship, I think that if you was to get cheated on, absolutely not. Mm. Because I think the mentality you'll have post that, you're just gonna keep destroying yourself. I don't think you can come back from that. However, let's say if it's in a business environment and you know, you're know you having a dispute with, let's say, one of the members in your team over a subject matter and things are said out of anger and conflict, you sometimes have to understand that certain people have certain trigger points that you yeah, might have not known about 100%. subconsciously. And people might have certain trauma responses because of things that have happened in the childhood. And that's not down to the reaction within the argument. That's down to how they were brought up as people. So I think it depends on the circumstance. I do believe 90% of the time in second chances. Mm -hmm. And I think that everybody can be, be forgiven either way, yeah, for sure. I agree. What do you look for in people in terms of like character traits when you bring them into your life, like within your inner circle? What are the main traits that you'd say are in your inner circle? I'd say the biggest one for me, emotionally, just having the right intentions, morally yeah. and ethically. Mm -hmm. Because in life, I think especially when you start to build somewhat of value, there's a lot of people who come into your life to try and take from you. Um, and I think you've got to be really, really self-aware of people at very early stages. And I like to call it the bullshit, the bullshit radar. So mm -hmm. if you're meeting somebody for the second time after that first instance, don't really give too, too much off, enough to show what your worth is. But at the same time, uh, don't give too much away. Stay mysterious in a way. Um, mm -hmm. 
And a lot of the time that will then allow you to see how the person then presents themselves the second time round. And what you also have to do is read the room. Like if you're out meeting some new friends and you're in a restaurant and the person speaks to the waiter like fucking shit, yeah. then who's to say that if you was the waiter in that position, if you've done nothing wrong and you've just brought a, a drink out late, how do you know they wouldn't have spoke to you like that? Yeah. So it's just reading the room and reading the environment and looking at how they also articulate with other people. Like you've just got to read how they act. Um, so there's a few things yeah like I'd, I'd say the biggest thing for me though is just genuine intention and if they're actually you know prepared to be there during difficult times a lot of people think life's happy and the best analogy I like to use is that if you look at a, a heart rate on an ECG machine right the heart rate goes up then down up then down all the time on an ECG so when it goes flat you die so you have to think sometimes, you know, you are going to be at low. Sometimes you're going to be at yeah. high. But That's it's, a good analogy. it's just understanding that you're not always going to be, you know, either side. It's always mm. bouncing. Um, it's really hard to find a straight line, in my opinion. Definitely. So, yeah. Definitely. Just be with people who show you love, have genuine intention, want to bring the best out of you as an individual and help you elevate into the person that you desire to be. I think that like what I'd like to do in regards to how I'd impact the new people that come into my life, I'd like to just be a role model for them. Regardless of where they are in their life, they could be 10 times richer than me. They could be a lot smarter than me. I don't really care about all of that. What it is for me is that, look, how can I make you feel like you need to unlock more of your own potential? Mm, do you definitely. know what I mean? That's a big thing. Yeah. Completely agree. When you get to 60 years old, would you prefer for people to read a book about your life or watch a documentary? Oh, that's a hard one. I'd say they're both very similar though. They very much go hand in hand. I would say probably watch a documentary just because I love looking back at old videos. Like I I used to do this thing in lockdown. I feel like probably quite a few people did it. There was nothing to do. I'd sit on TikTok and I'd make little montages of like all the videos I had from back in like uni. Because obviously lockdown, I miss going out, miss seeing all my friends. And I was like, do you know what? I put it all into like a little video clip. And I loved looking back at that because like you could see how happy I was in the clips. And I feel like I'm more of like a visual person. I do better with visuals. So with a documentary, you can visually see how happy everyone is and like the ups and the downs and everything whereas in a book I feel like it'd be hard to get that across especially if I'm the one who's written the book because I'm not great with words so I feel like I wouldn't describe it very well so I'd say documentary I think I'd be the same I'd want to have a documentary I've visionized now yeah when I'm 60 years old my children are going to sit in a cinema with me alongside my grandkids and I'm going to watch my life back like jackass on the cinema screen of all of the key moments in my life That'd be sick. Could you imagine that? That'd be really like good. Like you sat in a cinema with all all of your family just watch you, watching you and the boys just having the funniest moments you've ever had. That'd be amazing. And then your kids are like, oh yeah. Oh, so when you said, when you told me about that memory, this is what, yeah. this is what he was referring to. Yeah. But I will never tell my kids up until like, you know, 60 when I've got them, all of them documentaries made. Yeah. And all of them like little clips. Yeah. And then I'm going to speak about it at the dinner table with my wife. I'm going to be like, yo, so this is what me and your mum did during this holiday. This is what me and my friends yeah. got up to when I was 30. And these are the businesses that we built. And I'm going to tell them about it. But little do they know do that they're going to then watch it at the cinema after with me. Yeah, that's So yeah, true. they're going to have branded popcorn. I don't know, whatever <laughs> business we just sold it at the time. that like, can have the brand of that on there. And yeah, it'd be kind of cool, man. Yeah, so that's, a good, that's cool. a good idea. So... Oh, how to start it? Say, okay. like, I want to say about think, how we. Do you think your environment impacts your success? Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Do you think your environment impacts your success? Definitely. If you grew up in a small village and you're not around any other entrepreneur, how are you supposed to feel motivated and inspired by somebody else's success if you are stuck in a small village? Mm. And people often say, "Oh, well, it's too expensive." Earn more fucking money then. Like move to a town where you're around more entrepreneurs who will help you grow as a person and you will attract more financial gain into your life. Best analogy I like to use, yeah? If you go to the most expensive hotels in the UK, not stay there overnight, just go and drink a coffee inside that UK for fucking eight or nine or 10 pounds for the latte. I guarantee you now the audience of people and the caliber of individuals who go to that hotel coffee shop are gonna be a lot higher in status and performance than average Joe who's having a cup of coffee in Morrison's. Mm. So just position yourself. It's all about positioning. Same again with any business and within a market. 
if you've spotted one of your compet competitors like being aligned with a new trend and every single one of their videos is going viral, are we gonna go, go and then duplicate that viral clip? Yeah, so same again with other people around you. If you know there's been an entrepreneur who's made out of your area, moved to a specific city, I'm gonna be watching that guy and I'm gonna be seeing where he's going, mm -hmm. who he's chilling with, and I'm gonna be trying my best to communicate and network with that person. And I'm Definitely. gonna follow his steps because I know it's a proven blueprint and a strategy as to how I can also then elevate myself. Definitely. So yeah, hundred percent. That's why I don't actually mind spending a lot of money on hotels when I, I go away. Like I don't mind spending an extra 200, 300 pound a night just to stay in a better hotel, just to meet people in mm. that place. Like, and every single holiday I've ever been on in the last 12 months, I've made a connection. And every single time I go on holiday now, whether it's business or for leisure, I will always make a contact list of people on my notes for that country. So say I'm visiting Paris, I'll have my notes out in Paris with all of the contacts that I have in Paris. I'll message every single one of them person to check in with them the week before I go. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I'm going to Paris next week, what are you saying? Just even if it's a one-to-one -one catch up for 15 minutes just to retain yeah. the rapport. And then when I'm there as well, the waiters in the restaurants who I speak to, if I find one of them funny and I get along with one of the waiters, regardless if they're a waiter and they have no status, well, not no status, they've got a lot, they might have aspirations. It's not unfair of me to say, but regardless of what their goals are, I think it's important that you build a geographical network in every single country that you visit. Because mm -hmm. you've always got to remember you might only be one phone call away from somebody else. Mm -hmm. Right now, I am one phone call away from Drake. So that's my analogy wow. on everything in life. It's it's removing the middlemen in every aspect of your of your life, not just within business with a supplier, but also with the people that you network and communicate with. Definitely, so 100%. So just, just contact, contacts, build up your phone book. If you're, if you're wanting to become an entrepreneur, the biggest thing that you can do right now is every single person that you speak to when you are out and about, you save their phone number and you follow them on, on Instagram. Mm -hmm. We've got social media and the power of these devices right now, there's no excuses to why nobody can build a great master list of people. Like everybody has an equal chance, it's free game right now. Like you, anybody could go to anywhere, even if you just walked in a hotel and didn't even buy a coffee, you could go and speak to people inside that hotel, get their numbers, have a brief conversation and build an introduction. I think mm -hmm. it's important how you approach people as well. One thing that I spent so much time on when I was younger was when I was working part-time at Debenhams. I was 15, 16 years old, uh, no, 16 years old. And I used to help customers open up a Debenhams card. I wasn't able to run the credit at the time because I wasn't 18, but I would refer the leads to the checkout system at the front. And I would basically persuade customers to open a, debit, a, a Debenhams card up in order for them to get 10% of, off of their purchase. But I'd always just be split testing all the time, different intros to different customers. If let's say it was a repeat customer and I recognized the face, I'd remember the name from when they'd come in. Jenny, how are you doing? How was, how was your tea last weekend? Was it good? Oh yeah, what did you do on Sunday after you came in? I noticed you, you said you was gonna do X, Y, and Z. Mm. And it's having the retention of the information from what you spoke about with that person and then re-emphasizing it when you then see them again to show that you actually listen to what they said. And if it's a new customer, someone I'd never seen before, I'd approach them with something that a customer assistant wouldn't ever usually say. I'd always go in with a compliment. If they was wearing a nice pair of jeans, even though I might not have even liked the jeans, at the end of the day, I'm a salesman. Yeah. Oh, excuse me, mate. I was just wondering, did, did you buy them Levi's from here? Because I've not seen them out for a while. I'm sure they got discontinued a few months ago. Where did you buy them? And then it's curiosity. So every single person you split test different approach strategies. And people who are waiters right now, you can earn as much as somebody on a 30 to 40K a year salary, even if you're on 20 to 25K a year as a waiter. The amount you can make in tips from just simply building customer relationships and rebooking clients in the same week and every single week, mm -hmm. they will pay you if you become charismatic, entertaining, and you look after their table. Definitely. So become valuable and become you know, mysterious, become exciting, people will pay you to do that. How important is understanding attachment styles and relationships? Massively, massively. Why? I think it's so often overlooked in relationships and I think it's the root of a lot of problems in relationships and the reason a lot of relationships fail. You have to understand how your partner perceives things. So if they're like an anxious attach attachment style, they might not necessarily have as much trust in the relationship. They might have this fear constantly that you're going to leave them and X, Y, Z. And like, or they might not be able to show their emotions as well. And I think you need to 
be able to identify that and also identify whether your attachment style can work with that. Because if you're someone who's like a very secure attachment style and you're with someone who's quite an anxious attachment style and they're constantly not having trust in you and thinking the worst of you, then it's never going to work because you're always going to be made to feel like the bad guy and you have all this trust in the relationship and the other person doesn't. So do you think, it's do you think Do you think you need a water and a, a flame in a relationship? Like, do you think there needs to be water and fire? Like, mm. can water and water work? Like, cause my perspective yeah. is, yeah, is if there's two people who have avoidant attachment styles and there's some sort of, like, bad argument, like, because of ego a lot of the time, they're not prepared mm. to then solve and communicate about what the initial problem was because they're that avoidant that they don't actually just want to come to terms knock it on the head and have that conversation so do you think like it works better when there is someone to to throw out the flame like do you need someone you know like yang sweet and sour no you are right and i i also think on that i think you can change your attachment style as well so like you were saying about the war and the fire i think if if you do have someone who's like secure attachment type and someone who's that avoidant or anxious attachment type i think the war and fire works to an extent like i do think that yeah, you can have someone thrown out, but then it's not fair on the secure attachment type because they're going to be getting the brunt of everything all the time. But then I think like, I think the anxious and avoidant, I think they can learn a lot from the secure attachment type to then become more secure. But I think, I, in my opinion, I don't really think this could, this could be completely wrong as well because there's probably people who it does work for, but I don't think you can fully work in a relationship unless you become both secure attachment types within the relationship or you acknowledge the different attachment types and then you learn how to almost like deal with them. So like if you've got someone who in a relationship who's not as trusting, you recognise that and put in more effort in to build that trust and like reinforce the trust with them. I think they're the only ways it can work really in my opinion. Do you know what's mad though? I was thinking how many people actually even have these conversations with the friends? Oh, how many none. people actually Definitely. go out of the way to have a conversation with the friends and say, yo, I think I've got a bit of an anxious attachment style. What do you think I can do to further develop my mm-hmm. characteristics to ensure I can become more secure in my relationship? Because yeah. as a man, I'm telling you straight up, yeah? Mm. I could ask a lot of my friends what attachment style you. They won't have a clue what I'm talking about. No. So as a female, do you have a lot of friends who you do speak about these things with? And what do you think would help other females maybe have that confidence to come out and actually speak about it with the, their own friends and their own network. Like what, mm-hmm. do you reckon it's just having the, the confidence to just say, look, this is how I've acted in, in my relationship. This is this is what sort of person I think I am. Like, how do you even have the self-awareness to, to, to even determine what you are? I feel like for girls, definitely, like one of the main times that you're likely to speak about this sort of stuff is after a breakup or like a situationship ending or something like ending with a partner because obviously you're going through the healing process and whatever. It might be the same for guys as well. I'm just speaking on behalf of like the girls I know, like my girl group. But definitely I think that's when you would have conversations where you'd be like, oh, maybe this happened because of this attachment or whatever. Like, I think also it depends who you're surrounded by. So for me, like a lot of the people I'm surrounded by in my life are people who either are interested in like psychology, self-development, self-help, that sort of sector or like studied it at some point in school to have some sort of understanding of it. Whereas I think if you're surrounded by people who haven't ever studied it before or like read into it or heard about it, then obviously it's less likely to come up in conversation. But for me with my friends, definitely like stuff like that would come up when you're having those deep late night girly chats about like a breakup or something ending. And then I think that's what makes you think more um, and yeah, talk about with other people. I think men stay quiet in relationships because they're scared of perception. And what I mean by that is if you and your girl have an argument, the last thing you want to do as a man, in my opinion, is go and tell all of your friends about what has happened in this situation with that woman. Mm. Because the thing is, it's easy to put a bad taste in one of your friend's mouths about a specific person. Now, Mm. with you, you know that person more than all of your friends do. So you can accept the deficit with their behavior. However, Definitely. if you then put this bad taste on other people's mouths, and this is why I say shh about my relationships <laughs> and the bad things that happen, in, you know, it's not always smooth sailing. Mm. Like I'm not willing to really put that bad taste in other people's mouths. You don't know my girl like that. Do you know mm. what I mean? Yeah, no, I completely and agree. 
again, I feel like sometimes with women, on the other hand, depending on your attachment style, I feel like sometimes you can make bad decisions by telling too many people about bad things that happen yeah. in relationships. Yeah, but I agree. But it's your business. And that's not me saying don't speak about certain things with your friends and get opinions, because mm. I think it's important to do that. Yeah. But just remember what you tell this person will then impact what you listen to with their advice and what dictatorship they'll then think you should have in your relationship. No, I completely agree. Like people that I've been, um, if I've been like seeing people before or anything like that and stuff goes wrong, I'd never tell my friends about it in the moment. Mm. And then when I say things to them after it's ended, like, oh, like this might've happened, whatever. Then they're like, I'm glad you didn't tell me at the time because it would have made me dislike the person. So it's things like that. You don't, there's no point, like you said, like nobody knows the relationship better than you and whoever's in the relationship. So even though something might have been said to hurt you or upset you or something might have been done to hurt or upset you, as soon as you tell that to your friends in your inner circle, they are going to have your back no matter what and they'll just want to cut that person out. Mm. And sometimes you might also twist things and I can almost like exaggerate it or well, not even exaggerate it, but like yeah. you might say it in a way where you're like, oh, like they said this and they did this. And then you might actually want to take it back and be like, oh, actually it wasn't that bad. It was just a heat of the moment thing. So as soon, like I know for a fact, like there's, I've got like five girls who if I said someone had done something bad to me, they'd be like, he's getting blocked. Like he's, he's done he's out your life for doing that like they'll have my back but so yeah I'd always be careful about <laughs> what I'd say <laughs> yeah I'm not gonna I've, I've pissed my girl's friends off a few times before <laughs> I'm not I'm gonna be straight up to you my, my, my girl's friends have been pissed at me before oh. but at the end of the day truthfully no disrespect to you lot but it's got fuck all to do with you um it's my relationship but yeah nah fuck with you all as well but um <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, do you know what it is? Relationships are very hard because mm. you, you, you're almost a questioning, like, can you live long-term with this person? And can you see yourself being with this person for the rest of your life? And that's yeah. such a scary question to ask. And I hate when people turn around and say, oh, I'll live for the short term. I don't know where I'm going to be next week. No. Well, think about where you're going to be next week. Mm. Because do you know if you decide to just stay in, stay in the present tense and not think about the longevity of the relationship, how are you ever supposed to visionize whether or not this person can be a, the father to your child? Like with the characteristics and traits that they're demonstrating, like you've got to weigh up the good and the bad, of course, but mm. you've always got to f picture things long term. I think that's why being a visionary is so important. I've seen so many videos on Conor McGregor speaking about him buying private jets and having the wife that he's now got and the beautiful children that he's had, all because he's said it all his life. And when mm. you speak things and you articulate um, ideal idealization, like you'll only attract these things. Uh, I've seen Bob Proctor speak about uh, goals and subordinate goals and how you should change the things that you want in life to present. I want a Lamborghini Urus. I have a Lamborghini Urus. And what I'll also do is when I'm on the way to work in the morning in my current car, I will visionize the interior of a Lamborghini Urus. Mm. This watch on my wrist, I will visionize, even though I might have a Casio watch, a Rolex Day Day. And then I'm going yeah. to keep telling myself every day, oh, yo, I need to wear this watch. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've got it. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. constant manifestation and 100%. visualization. Like I can tell you now exactly how like our future offices are going to look in Dubai when we yeah. globally expand even the offices in Miami and how the interior design has been laid out in mm. our current showroom from when I've spoke about it in the past with the certain features that are in there with how the shoe wall looks, with where yeah. the TV is going to be, with the shelves, drew it on a piece of paper. Mm. And then even with the relationship that I've now got, like not got exactly what the doctor ordered. <laughs> I'm, joking, <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. I've, uh, no, no, I have, I have, I'm very blessed. But um, <laughs> like, uh, no, I, I've got a beautiful woman. Um, she's got some amazing characteristics. She's very strict with things when I don't respect her boundaries. And these were all things that I wrote down with what I wanted in a woman mm. um, when I was manifesting that. So I think it's important that not only from a wealth and materialistic standpoint, also mm -hmm. visualize what sort of friends you wanna attract into your life Definitely. and visualize your health. Visualize being able to be flexible when you're 60 to 70 years old because what that'll do is then attract you to become more proactive with, with your fitness. Yeah. Start to yeah. stretch more, make sure you can move your joints. The biggest flex that you can possibly have when you're 70 is being able to do yeah. a marathon. Like fuck status, like I will be multi, multi, multi millionaires by then. I wanna be able 
when I'm 70 with my boys, when I'm sat in my villa in Hawaii, I want to be able to say to the boys when I've got them around the villa, yo, let's go for a run on the beach. And I want to win them in the race when I'm 70 years old doing a sprint on the beach. That's yeah. the real flex. Yeah, and a lot of people, especially entrepreneurs, what you have to think about is when you take status mm -hmm. and financial gain away from your life, who are you at the core as a person? Yeah. And what can you deliver to those around you when all of that is taken away? Yeah. Um, and I think that's one of the things of, as to how you can build more self-confidence and more self-trust, more self-love, which is what I'm trying to practice now. I've always been quite an insecure person. I think I've definitely got an anxious attachment style and I love nothing more to explore that realm of thinking when I don't have status or I don't have any finance, like what can I provide for not only my woman mm. and those around me? Yeah, 100%. Uh, 100%. Yeah. I think visualization and like manifestation as well is so overlooked by many people. Like I think a lot of people, they'll hear about it and just think, oh, it doesn't do anything. But unless, until you start doing it, as soon as you start doing it, you realize the effects of it. Like even this morning, this like I was sat on the tram and this influencer that I followed posted that she was at a workout class around the corner from work. And I just saw a post and I was like, oh, imagine like, that'd be really funny if I walked past from the street. I kid you not, I get off the tram as I'm walking down the road of where that workout class is, she walks out. Who was it? I don't want to say her name because she's... It's say it, run it. Say it. Someone called Megan Short. So sick, she's, sick, sick. she's like a fit, well, she was like a fitness influencer and she does like all these events in Manchester um, where like she helps like girls meet like new people and like people who don't know anyone. Like she does some amazing, amazing events. Like I think what she does in is incredible. Um, but yeah, it was just so random because That's I was like, crazy. I was literally thinking like just a little thought like, oh, imagine if like, I walked past you in the street. I didn't say anything because I'm never, I'm too scared to say anything to people. But yeah, like even stuff like that, like you can just have a little thought like that in your brain and that what manifested. What was her name? Megan. Megan, yeah. Right, Megan, if you see this video, you <laughs> catch Kairos in the streets, make sure you drag her in. <laughs> she's gonna come up to you next time if she sees you as well <laughs> no that's it it's, yeah. it's so, so powerful as a female in this present day who is your role model i feel like you already know my answer to this because i bang on about her like every day i've made jack follow her i've said that he needs to adopt her routine and i, I have, think it's I have. incredible but grace beverly I just think what she's accomplished in the last few years is insane. Like the fact she built her first business when she was still at university, doing her degree at Oxford is insane. But, and then like the fact as well, like how she's built this entrepreneur mindset and like she's come out with this planner, which I've said you need to get, the productivity method. She like does all the time blocking and everything. Like it, it I, I don't know. I just think it's incredible how she's, got all these businesses she keeps such a level head about them obviously I don't know her as a person so like you never know what goes on behind the scenes like it might be a lot but I think as well one of the key things about her as an entrepreneur she gives a lot of free value to people like if like every other day at least she'll do some sort of a story where she's given advice on like life entrepreneurship business anything um, and she'll do like the question boxes which I've said is something that you should definitely do where you like ask people to ask you their questions and then give them advice for free and she just does that on all of her stories and I think that's amazing and she just comes across really confident in how she operates and she's always as well speaking about like learning more and like even with the podcast she does she's always learning from people which is like like we spoke about before like you always need to be learning even when you're at the top you could be like the top person in the world and I feel like you still need to be learning to keep your brain active more than anything mm. as well, but also just to better yourself. But yeah, she does an amazing job at that. Um, yeah, she's definitely very inspiring for sure. What is your opinion on women in leadership and some of the more masculine figures having their views on women wanting to progress with their career? In terms of negative masculine views? That's for you to decide. Do you think well, it's primarily more negative now? I would say it's getting better but I still think predominantly it's quite negative towards women um, in leadership roles. I think there's still such a big stigma that women aren't as well like knowledge or as intellectual or know all about like the back end. I think definitely like a, a, the thought of like a woman having knowledge on the back end and systems and how the operation side works. I think a lot of men were just saying, oh, like women don't know anything about that. When it comes to the creatives, I feel like most men would be like, yeah, okay, like women might have the edge, but I've, even then that's not the case in all cases. Yeah. So, but yeah, I feel like definitely 
for I think it's still predominantly negative that uh, there's a lot of men out there that would look at women in leadership roles and think that should be a man, yeah. which isn't right at yeah. all. And they're completely wrong. But I do think it's still a bit of a stigma, yeah, for sure. Yeah. My view on like a relationship, let's say with a woman in leadership, mm. my perspective is on it. I'm more than happy for my woman to pursue a job of her choice and do whatever she actually wants to do and what will make her happy. Mm -hmm. um, however, my preference personally, like I'm not gonna use that as a red flag to say, you know what, no, I don't wanna be with this person. Yeah. But I think for me, I'd rather have a woman who I guess can almost be at peace, I guess. Cause yeah. I feel like there's a, lot, there's a lot of associated stress that comes within leadership and a lot of strain so the last thing that I want to do is come home when I've had a very stressful day, managing a lot of different people, having some really intense conversations, and then my woman also doing the same thing. Because when you come home from work, especially if you've had a stressful day, you're only presenting the worst version of yourself to your other half. Mm -hmm. And if she's also doing the same thing, when she might be able to preserve a bit more energy, when it comes to the end of the day, I don't know if that could maybe have an impact on the relationship. No, I so I still need to experiment it. Like my goal is in, you know, like a, a really good professional role in a business. Uh, she's doing amazing, but like she doesn't demonstrate them traits within the home life. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but I think if, it keeps it out of the home. I think if she was maybe to progress a little further and take more responsibility on, she might get a bit more overwhelmed. And everybody thinks that a partnership should be 50-50. In my mm -hmm. opinion, how it should work is that you might operate at 80% one day, I might operate at 20%, Completely I might be agree. at 60, you might be at 40. You can never find a true equilibrium with it being 50-50 because that will never be the case. But it's also making sure that you can have time for each other um, where you can present the best versions of yourself, not after a day of subconscious stress. Mm -hmm. On a weekend, on a Sunday, you might allocate that as your rest day and your relaxing period where you've not had a, you know, bullshit. It's just, yeah, I completely you know. agree. I do think it would be mm. hard to have two CEOs, for example, in a relationship. I mm. feel like that would be difficult. I feel like, yeah, you could probably make it work, but I think it, it would be, you'd have to put a lot of, I th effort in so much to make effort. It work. And, and do you know what it is? I think personally, if I was with another female who was a CEO, mm. I believe that I would not be able to help myself, but say to her, Oh, so what did you get up to work today? Tell mm. me a bit more about oh, what's happening X, Y, and Z with this project. And yeah. just because of who I am as a person, I would yeah. not be able to help into myself things. to say, oh, have you tried yeah. maybe implementing this? Um, oh, maybe we should sit down tonight and have a look at trying to build this within into your ecosystem. Yeah. And I think that if I then had that with another CEO in a family and outside of a work a work life balance, yeah. uh, because I'm too curious. Like I like to, especially when I meet other entrepreneurs, I like to identify challenges and. And, f and drawbacks within their business models. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time as an entrepreneur, you can plug and play them data sets into multiple infrastructures. And Definitely. I just feel like if I was doing that on top of everything I do now, with mm -hmm. also friends' businesses when I'm trying to help other people out and give that free value away, imagine doing that with my own wife. I think my life would yeah. just be 24 seven business. It is pretty much yeah. that now. And your that downtime with your woman, having them irrelevant conversations about what Karen did earlier on in that day, like, yeah, you, don't, you, you know that. what I mean? Like yeah. it's some, sometimes nice to have other conversations. Life's not always about business and mm. conquering the world. Of course, it's important to have them dreams and it's a masculine trait to have. It's important to have dreams. But yeah, right. I think sometimes it's, uh, it's, like, it's like having a conversation with your nan, right? Yeah. You've, always, you've got to always understand who the recipient is. 100%. Who, what, where and how 100%. and what that conversation looks like. I'm not going to go into conversations about email marketing and PPC with my nan. Do you no, know what I mean? No. Like she just needs to understand that she's going she's gonna to be nice. And you know what I mean? She's going to go for a coffee at Costa. She can tell me about how a weekend was with Kath, her best <laughs> friend. She can tell me what clothes she bought. Like, and I'm going to gas her up and tell her her dress looks nice. And that's, that's all she needs to know. She doesn't need to know about the tech yeah. ins and outs of... No, life. that's not what it's about. No, you know what I mean, yeah, completely agree. How do you want to be remembered? I'm going to be honest. Like, I don't really care too much about how I'm remembered, and the reason yeah. for that is because I'm just a small strain in thousands of years in this universe, with probably over a hundred billion people who've been on this planet. I don't know what mm. the stats actually. I, nobody actually could even ever tell. No. But 
the whole point is, is that as long as I've made a positive impact and I've helped numerous people in this life and um, looked after my family, that truly, I think, is all I actually care about. Mm -hmm. Like, do you know what it is? In 50 to 100 years from now, nobody's really going to think too much about what Elon Musk accomplished. Like, okay. yes, it's revolutionary. In fact, maybe 50 to 100 years is too short term in a thousand years from now. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to be able to look back and say, oh, yeah, Jackie Lee built this revolutionary business and did X, Y, and Z. We are just small strains in this world. 100%. We're a needle in a haystack. 100%. Um, so, yeah, just live the most whilst you're in this life. Um, live to the, the fullest potential of what you possibly can. Um, don't take life too seriously and enjoy yourself. I think it's the I biggest agree. thing. Like How do you want to be remembered, Karis? Well, it's similar to what you were saying, to be fair. Like, mainly... I'm I'm not really bothered about being remembered as bad as that probably sounds like I was about to say that um if you think about it in like 50 to 100 years time anyway or like 100 years time nobody really will be left on the earth that knew you personally or will remember you like you might be someone's like great grandparent or something but they won't really remember you so realistically i think it's more about impacting the lives in your present life rather than how you're viewed after your life and how you're remembered i think it's leaving an impact on the people that are left when you go in terms of they've had great memories with you and they think of you as like having been a good influence in their life um that's that's always one thing for me i always want to feel like i'm having a good influence on mm. the people around me's life and that i'm bringing something good to their life i never want to feel like i would never want to be draining to someone I always want to be like an uplifting energy source to people so I feel like yeah I feel like it's more of a focus on the present than being rem remembered I'd say wow that's very beautiful thanks do you think the social credit system has any correlation currently to the Paris QR code system that's currently in place for the right, just to clarify what the social credit system is in Beijing what they wanted to understand is how great of a citizen you were and how they determined that was on multiple factors. Your places of interest, how much money you earned, um, X, Y, and Z. And you'd have a score based on these factors that would be out of a thousand mm. to rank you as a citizen in Beijing. And the reason they did this was to accumulate as much data as possible about you as a person. Now, in Paris at the moment during the Olympics, you're limited to what areas you can access in Paris and you need a QR code to pretty much get to the desired lo location you want to go to. And in order for you to register for a QR code, you need to see what hotel you're staying at, give them the passport number uh, or a proof of ID with a different reference number and the reason you need to go to that specific location. And in my opinion, from the government's perspective, the reason they introduced this QR code system, rather than just having more wardens on every street mm. corner to you know, navigate this infrastructure, um, was simply for data. Like if they're having so. citizens coming in from other countries, of course they're gonna know where the most popular location is in regards to what accommodation they may be staying at because they wanna know where the biggest tourist attractions are. Mm. And not only that, they wanna know the age of the tourists that are coming into the country. They wanna know the genders, they wanna know where they're from. Um, and I think a lot of the time, especially as an entrepreneur now, I understand from a macro perspective within my business how important data really is. So if I'm doing this in my business for qualitative and quantitative data now in regards to the clientele that we attract, how much money do they earn? Where are they from? What is their occupation status? And what is actually their employment type currently? Like what role mm -hmm. are they in within a business? So if I'm wanting to know that level of curiosity a micro perspective, sorry. How is the government and other organizations not wanting to gather the same amount of information, but on a much more macro perspective? Mm. And I'm not gonna say the word, the C word, but I think personally that was the purpose of that as well, to acquire as much information about every single person as possible. And that's why, again, they've looked into producing a digital passport um, with open banking. Now you can clearly see you know, like banks want to see what you're spending every single penny on in order to determine if you're eligible to even get credit. Like mm -hmm. they don't like when you withdraw cash now because if you withdraw cash, that decreases your credit score because they can't see where you're spending the cash. Mm -hmm. So there's all of these factors that are pretty much like irrelevant. Um, but again, everything is data reliant. When it comes to especially when 
you're merging or selling a company, um, when it comes to you wanting to exit a company as well, based on conversations I've had, I've had with other entrepreneurs, the biggest thing that VCs and angel investors will look for is uh, how does the business function when the CEO isn't present? And alongside that, based on the data that you've acquired, how much do you know about your customers? So within the designer spectrum, the reason Flannels acquired Cruise Fashion uh, and Cricket Fashion and uh, Matches Fashion recently is because of the amount of data they've collected over the past decade about their consumers in regards to the shoe mm -hmm. size, the clothing size, when the birthdays are, and X, Y, and Z. Because they know, by, they know by reverse squeezing this data within their own marketing strategy, whether it's through email campaigns, SMS, even having a sales team dialing the customers for the top VIP spenders. Mm -hmm. From you buying a company for 10 million, how fast can you recoup that 10 million from that merge and acquisition from simply making that company part of your group? And when yeah. you look at the lifetime value of a client, you can work out the mean average of what a customer in a CRM system will spend over 12 months and have a true projection and calculation of how long it's gonna take you to recoup that acquisition cost for the merge. Definitely. And that's why I think you know, it's, it's important that data can never be neglected, especially if 100%. other organizations, just for common life, you have to give that data away. Definitely. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's my opinion on it. I went on a bit of a rant there. <laughs> so guys, we might have gone a little bit off topic there. This podcast, I don't even know what you want to call it, chit chat, <laughs> might have not necessarily even made sense when we've edited it and put it together because we've just took different questions and answers from different topics we wanted to discover and put it into one video for you to get us to know as people. So on that notice, we're going to wrap it up there and me and Karis are going to try and get more of these videos done. We just wanted to do a test run to see how it performed first see how many people were interested and we need to know in the comments below if you want us to make this a series i'm not going to put any time expectations on this I've done that in the past i don't like to let people down no. so let us know in the comments if you want more of these clips where it's just generic life business motivation chit chat um and you have had yep. your hosts jack and kaz jack and kaz <laughs> jack and kaz you can only call her kaz though if you know her yeah, we call it a Kaz in the streets. Just right. Karis. Karis in the don't. streets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, guys, make sure to subscribe as well. It means absolutely everything to us as well. So yeah, peace out, Jack and Kaz. Let's go.